this. This is a passage from Melanie's website. Uh, I call her a folk singer. She said that she's hard to define. She does many things. I put her in the ranks of Joni Mitchell and all of those, okay? Joan uh, Baez. Joan Baez, all those great yes. folk singers. Uh, Pete Seeger died this week, yes. which maybe we'll ask her if she knew him too. But this is what she wrote about herself on her, I believe she wrote she it herself. She didn't write this herself. Okay, it was written, it was written about, about her, her on her website. Melanie, who became the voice of an era in one magical instant on stage at Woodstock, has been putting the pieces in order. Pieces of a career scattered by the winds of experience and assembled again by the force of love into the most personal and brilliant moments of her musical journey. Melanie is poised to enlighten new generations about what it means to sing with both passion and eloquence, to write at once with intelligence and emotion, and in, to inspire through song. And nobody does this better than Melanie. My God, here she was. We, we saw her on an interview, early interview with Johnny Carson. And he had asked her how old she was when she, I believe it was when she did Woodstock. She said she thought she was 18. She was so young, okay, they had the motorcycle gangs that was doing security. She didn't have a performer's pass. They kept yanking her out of the performer's <laughs> area because she was so young. Right. A voice that mature at that age, a voice, as one critic said, far beyond her years. Yes. Sings like an angel. Yes. And still does. All right, so let's go ahead and give her a call. Hopefully she's ready. I, I gave her a call about five minutes ago when she said she needed ten minutes. Yeah. So hopefully she's ready. She'll make me feel better with her transcendental meditation <laughs> and her dulcet tones. Let's give our first guest tonight a call. Because God knows it's hard to breathe. <laughs> Hi, is this Melanie? Yes. All right. Well, this is Terry and Tiffany with Colt Radio A Go Go. Let me do the official introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, okay. We're, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're very excited to welcome our first guest tonight. She is a legendary singer who you may remember for her songs like What Have They Done to My Song Ma, Brand New Key, and Lay Down Candles in the Rain. And she's joining us to talk not only about her career, but also about the New York City Fab 50 uh, celebration of the music of the Beatles that's happening next weekend. We're very excited to welcome the one and only Melanie. You're on the show live with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Great. Well, I must say, Melanie, so, I'm, um, hi, hi. I'm an original fan. I'm not feeling too good tonight. Uh, sorry for that. My voice is a little off. But you've always made me feel better. Every time I ever listen to your records, I'm expecting that to happen. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. Wow. That's my job. That's it is my your job. job. <laughs> and I'm so glad you're still around doing this. Man, how long have you been in show business now? Uh, yeah, it's funny that you say show business. I never considered myself a show business person. <laughs> but it's, it's true, it is show business, I suppose. Um, I've been singing and writing my own songs for longer than the term singer songwriter has been around. Wow. They used to actually, there wasn't a, a term singer songwriter when I started. They called, used to call me the female Bob Dylan because they didn't have. A term that said a, a woman who wrote her own songs. Right. But, um, that term, singer songwriter, hadn't emerged. That's been about 40, 45 years, I suppose. Well, you know, I was telling the listeners before I got on here uh, with the interview that it's really true because before the days of Madonna when some celebrity had one name, well, I suppose there was Cher, but outside of Cher, there was really nobody else that you knew by one name other than you. I didn't even know you had a last name. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I have to get one. <laughs> Can you help me? <laughs> uh, no, um, yeah, well, even, even Cher, it was funny and Cher when I when I started out, so it didn't officially count as a one name person because most, you know, they're funny wow. to share. But uh, then, of course, yes, later it was just share. Well, for but, all, all. Yeah, no, I, I went by Melanie. That was, just, it was a, I guess it was the record company that put just Melanie, born to be, and it just stuck. Wow. You know, I guess they figured, um, there weren't any other Melanies, you know, so it wasn't like they had to clarify it or anything. So that's how that happened. I, kn I didn't say, yeah, I want to be a one name. <laughs> you know, I want to be Elvis. <laughs> 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 it was, uh, I just, you know, it just happened, you know, that, that it was called Melanie. And because it was an odd name at the time, 
there was only one Melanie that I, uh, people would always say, are you named after Melanie and gone with the wind? Uh. And, no, I'm named after my Ukrainian grandmother, who was Melania. Ah. And that's how I got Melanie. Well, let me let me ask you for the listeners that don't know. Um, I mean, I've seen you in interviews and things like that, and and you seem like a very kind of quiet, shy, almost kind of person. How did you end up getting involved in becoming it, a performer? Yeah, it, well, it, it is irony. I mean, it's really strange because I have, I'm complete natural born introvert, and um, my husband, however the producer of every record I ever made, right up until the last uh, CD, um, was uh, an extrovert. And he he just saw me out there. And, and uh, I, I just mostly, you know, he would just lead me to the event and I would go out and on stage. Once I'm on stage, I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Somehow that feels like, like a safe place. But... It's the before and after, and the meeting people, and and um, I, I was it was a, a real uh, hardship for me to to um, endure that. But he was really good at it, so he he was the one who got me out and about. But um, he passed away three years ago, and Bo oh. and I, my son, uh, his, it was his father, and we were a real team. You know, we're a threesome, and my two daughters saying we were, you know, it was like the traveling Melinda's, you know. Wow. <laughs> we were we're just this big family of uh, real close. We were really close. And it happened uh, kind of all of a sudden, so we, Bo and I are still doing it. We, we feel this, it's our, it's our, that's what I'm supposed to do. And yeah. I, I know uh, <clears throat> he would want me to be doing this, so um, it's a whole new universe, you know, I'm I've got a, a new representative uh, helping me. Uh, of course, you know, no one could ever take the place of a person that does everything. You know? right. <laughs> but um, we're, we're working there. Well, I'm, I'm sure he was a great guidance. I don't know maybe he had something to do with this because the thing that I admired about you, and, and maybe your husband was involved with this, what I'm getting to now, is back in the early days, and we've had a lot of celebrities on, a lot of singers, Tommy James, and, and they all talked about issues with record companies. You were on Buddha, which I thought was a really cool company because the label was cool. I guess that's why I thought it was cool. But you actually had, <laughs> yeah. you actually had issues with Buddha, and you wound up leaving. Now, back in those days, artists didn't really do that, did they? No, we, we, um, well, for me, my motivation was um, I wanted to be able to, to project myself as who I am. And I, I got labeled as this because the record company had, you know, bubblegum music, mm-hmm. it was called then. And, um, and I was, uh, you know, I saw myself as a serious kind of a singer and songwriter. And, um, uh, the way they projected me was always this sort of beautific, um, kind of blissful mini, you know. Right. And I, I, I really objected to that. But what I didn't realize is that, um, I mean, what, what happened, this is real irony. We started our own label, and it was really just for artistic integrity. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, you know, maybe my husband's motivations were different. I'm not sure because he was a businessman. He was, um, you know, the mover and the shaker, and I was the artist. You know, I, I was always allowed to just create and do things. And I, I was realizing that I was being perceived as something that I wasn't. Um, so I thought my solution would be to start my own label. So we started our own label, which was called Neighborhood. And um, it was distributed through Gulf and Western. And uh, it, it, I thought, this is it. I can now show who I am to the world. <laughs> and there I, I record brand new key of all things. <laughs> then, um, I mean, I, I, my husband and I had so many fights about this <laughs> because this is just what I didn't want, you know, to... So it, as, as, if things weren't bad enough, you know, as far as people perceiving me as the cutest little thing, you know, that ever hit, 
1650 Broadway, um, the, uh, you know, the, it was all over after Brand New Key. I was doomed to be cute for the rest of my life. Well, that's for sure. I, I take it probably what you're referring to is because many people have said you're a reluctant pop star, and everybody really looked at you as a pop star once Brand New Key came out, right? Oh, my God. That was the kiss of death for, for because, you know, it was a time of them against us, and uh, I think there was the, 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 you know, the group that the groups that were very just strictly pop, uh, you know, and there was Bobby Sherman and the Archies and, you know, they were considered pop. And then there were the, you know, the, the angstful people who opposed the war and they were more um, relevant to the times. And um, I kind of escaped both categories <laughs> because I wasn't really angstful enough to be, you know, uh, Joan Baez. And I wasn't poppy enough to be, you know, uh, one of those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I kind of, I was kind of a, a genre skirter. You know, I didn't really have a, uh, and it's always been the case. I mean, I don't think you can have more varied songs. I and mean, I wrote Beautiful People and Candles in the Rain and Look What They've Done to My Song Line and Brand New Key and Peace Will Come and... Uh, I mean, I was all over the eclectic map musically, so I, I was, um, I just loved creating in all sorts of styles of music, and um, so it was always hard to pigeonhole me as well as, uh, you know, coupled with my personality. Um, that's why my new album is called Ever Since You Never Heard of Me. <laughs> There are little, little, little pockets of um, where people know who Melanie is, but there are others that they say who. <laughs> well, let me ask you. I mean, in talking about your new album and in talking about the fact that uh, you know, I'm sure people have a very strong uh, remembrance of your music. I'm sure some people probably remember Brand New Key the most. Other people may have remember other stuff that you've done, like, you know, Lay Down Candles in the Rain and stuff like that. Do you worry when you're creating your new album about making and writing songs and singing songs that is going to play to that? Do you worry that you're kind of stereotyped into a certain theme now? Well, that's, that's like for me, if I can just interject, because you really put me in mind of somebody like a Joan Baez. And I know you said once that, that you're not just a folk singer. Right. Uh, you know, I don't... I, I'm an artist. I create things. And, and what the world or pop music or, or underground music or whatever alternative makes of it, I don't know. I can't be held responsible. I never really worried about where it was going to place me. I think um, the mistake... Um, that uh, like young creators are making is that they're more concerned with which market mm -hmm. their music is going to hit. And then rather than just create your own little universe, that's why a lot of stuff sounds so much alike. Right. You know, that, um, because there's, people are, are afraid to, to be an individual because it might not, you know, in the right category, I never, I never was in the right category. You know, I'm, I'm, I was always uh, a little bit left of whatever or right of whatever. And, you know, and so um, I never kind of fit. Right. Certainly, even Brand New Key was an odd thing. It wasn't, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, a formula pop song. <laughs> it was kind of, it, I hate. I was so. I, I could not believe how, how that pigeon holds me. And yet, when I look at it now, I think, wow, what a great song. Right. So <laughs> it, it just like it was its own little unique thing. Mm -hmm. And, it, and um, I've, I couldn't, you know, write another one. Um, you know, I think that, um, that's uh, I'm too unpredictable for the, the music industry. Right. And that's how it always went. So it was it was why we, we I thought we needed our own label is that I can, you know, just do what I, I do. And I can sing a song with a an all black gospel choir and um and then I can do something quirky about 
roller skating, remembering when I was roller skating when I was a little kid. And, and you know something? Uh, learning that, how to ride a bike. And, that it's what it was about, too. And, and I'm one of the crazy people <laughs> back in the day that thought it had sexual references. And, and it's just about kids, oh, right? Yeah, well, you know, it got me banned on many radio stations <laughs> in America because um, they did. They said it was a sexual innuendo. And, and uh, I, me, I'm totally naive. I, I, was, I was just writing about... Um, I was remembering um, learning how to ride a bike and roller skating, and it and and it was just that's what I was capturing in the song. I I didn't, didn't get the sexual reference, <laughs> but I was one of those girls in school, you know, where people would be telling some kind of had a dirty punchline, and I would be like, huh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Melanie, you have done so many amazing things throughout your career. I mean, to have been able to have performed at Woodstock, you were on the Johnny Carson show, you sang with Johnny Cash, but one of the things that I wanted to ask you about uh, is definitely related to the event that is coming up next weekend, and that was you actually got a chance to sing with John Lennon on stage at the one-on-one, live uh, in New York City at Madison Square Garden in 1971. What was that like? What was John like? And what was it like performing with him? Well, he was a very, um, he was super cordial. I mean, and um, after the, the show, I, I was, it was a kind of spur of the moment thing. And, and I went down there and I'm singing. It didn't, you know, we, we were all working then. And I, I know it might sound, uh, almost obnoxious of me, I guess, but I didn't really think of him as, as a, a, a legend. You know, he was a, a guy who sang and, right. and wrote songs. And, uh, he, he, well, of course, you know, he, he uh, was with a group called the Beatles, you know, and I I only tuned into the Beatles in their, yeah. um, in the, the Revolution White Album, Abbey Road era. I wasn't really a Beatles, you know, one of the, the screamy girl things it didn't that didn't happen. I saw others in my school who did, but that wasn't my thing. I was I was a Joan Baez fan. <laughs> so um, and Keith Seeger and I grew up with folk songs and jazz jazz music and so that wasn't my my I wasn't a Beatles fan until way, way later. And um, and then I I I was working and really, really busy, and uh, I had this great opportunity to go to Madison Square Garden and uh, do that that concert with them. And there were other people. I think mean, Stevie Wonder was there, and I was super impressed with that. But um, and but John Lennon was so personable, you know that I didn't I didn't uh, feel intimidated or anything. Whereas. Some people did kind of do that, but again, I was shy, and he was um, he was a, a flirty kind of guy, you know. So I, I tended to really good retreat, you know, from that. So uh, I remember at the end of the, the show, Yoko Ono Ono gave me a black rose, mm-hmm. and I always wondered. What does that mean? <laughs> 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 so, I don't know, but um, but I always I always love his unique um, contribution to that Beatle thing because I, I really think that that there was this total opposite going on with Paul McCartney and John Lennon, mm-hmm. and John Lennon was the out there artist creator. And um, and and Paul McCartney was more the uh, um, in the in the school of pop English hits, you know, the, the, that kind of a writer. Right. And um, I mean, it really, it, he had the much more of the the bubblegummy pop thing going. And John Lennon had the total reverse, you know, total opposite. <laughs> and I I think that's what made it so unique. And, uh, you know, I got a phone call um, from Jerry Lieber, like Lieber and Stoller, uh-huh. and he's, 
he said, this was the biggest compliment in my whole life. He said, the, the thing I love about your music, Melanie, is that like the Beatles, you're able to intersect commerciality and art. Right, no, it's And true. I think to a great degree, I think that's um, why John Lennon and, and Paul McCartney were such an amazing uh, match mm-hmm. artistically. It's so true what he said, and here you were back in the day, and it was the era of Woodstock, and you were so young and, and so beautiful, and I don't think people really took you serious when they looked at your cute little face, and then you came out with that. I mature. know. You know, I, I look at that now, and I think I didn't ever feel beautiful, ever, ever, ever. I never felt cute, or I always thought I had a funny nose, and I, and I didn't quite have the right body type, and... Um, so I, I never felt, you know, like a person that would, was looked at as beautiful. But now that I'm, I look back on my photos, uh, and I, I think, wow, I think that was probably a strike against me at that particular time because um, the girls that were considered serious and, you know, they were much more... You know, not uh, not that not pretty, but not in that way that I was. But, but, right. I mean, I didn't. I didn't know. You know, I didn't even know. But now that I look at it, I think it really worked against me. Well, I'll tell you one you know? one one reviewer said uh, a voice beyond your years is true. You had such a mature voice, and you talk about the Beatles being so legendary. People, there, there are certain people in music that just achieve that status. Like if you go into like a, a memorabilia store, you see your your Marilyn, your Elvis stuff, your Beatles stuff. Anyone that did Woodstock, man, you are you are in. And and to know that you did that festival, and really you kind of stood out because here you were young and cute, and the other ones were a little bit more hard edge. But you got up there, and you belted out candles in the rain, and, and you were awesome. I, I guess, really, even the guards. You know, it, so it was really crazy, because um, that was an era that they really, I mean, we need to have more of that, because there's so much polarization yeah. of different kinds of music. Mm-hmm. And it's almost, I mean, marketing has gotten to such, to be a high science of uh, manipulation, so that people are, being manipulated to be a market to sell a product rather than marketing people finding out what kind of, um, you know, a group they, they, your, their product should sell to. So um, I think uh, that there was this era when, when anything, I mean, to be on the same stage several times with uh, Jimi Hendrix, mm-hmm. you know, and doing concerts with Jimi Hendrix, me, you know, this flower power, you know, <laughs> with me. But, but um, you know, it worked because people were open, open-minded. And uh, it, it's amazing how how closed is, uh, the categories have become. That's, uh, but I think that's got to change. You know, people, people are, are kind of tired of being shoved into For sure. Well, I, didn't want, oh. I just wanted to mention one more thing about Woodstock. I'd heard an early interview you did in, in Florida, some local access, cable access show, and you had said, and I don't know if it was because the way that, that, that you look so young and cute, and you really didn't look like everybody else. You certainly had the power in your voice as everybody else. But I guess security was run by the local motorcycle gangs, and you didn't have a performer's pass, and they kept yanking you out because they thought you were a <laughs> fan, Right. Right. Well, that, no, this happened at Woodstock, and that probably happened at other places too. But <laughs> I was an unknown at Woodstock. Mm-hmm. I, I wasn't. I wasn't famous. I hadn't had a record on top forty. I, I, I would say maybe a percent of that audience, one percent maybe, heard me on WNEW FM, which was like the underground radio station FM, and. Um, I I walked on that stage an unknown person, and I think the phenomenon of me at Woodstock is that when I walked off, I was a celebrity. So it it really linked me with that festival, in in that it it kind of was the catalyst for my whole career. Yeah, for nice. sure. So what are you going to sing at the Beatles event? Because we know we got that coming up next weekend. Yes, I know. Well, 
I'm extra excited because uh, Roger Kellaway, who did the um, arrangement of Brand New Key, is going to be um, one of the music directors, and he is uh, he's going to be there, and we're going to do Brand New Key. It's going to be a historic moment. Wow. We're doing uh, Brand New Key together for the for the since 40 years, you know. Wow. We've never done it. We've never, ever done it since the recording of it. So we're going to... Um, He's the one who came up with that, you know, with the prepared piano sound. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, Peter Peter loved it and went with it, you know. And uh, we, uh, and that was actually I thought because Roger was a a jazz guy, you know. He had a quartet and and Roger Kellaway, and he was very into avant garde uh, things and. In fact, we prepared the piano. You know, we he actually like John Cage. You know, prepared the piano with tacks and bolts and rubber bands and pieces of chewing gum. And here we have this, I don't know, Bosendorfer or something in the studio, and we were putting things in the strings of the piano to to give it that um, that odd little um, frequency ring. You know, that that it had. And, but I thought, oh, well, I'm safe. I'm going to be, I'll be in the avant-garde. <laughs> but it, it didn't happen exactly that way. Right. <laughs> Not with Peter around. Peter was determined that that was going to be a hit record. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, but, it's but, real okay. unfortunate. It's unfortunate we're running out of time because I'm, I'm telling you, Melanie, like I gave the committee a list and you were first on my list and this is like the Aww, biggest honor I, oh my god thank to be god. able to talk to you because like you're it man you're you're melanie oh well before, thanks so much thank you before we go uh i would like you to once again tell the listeners uh about your new album uh when it's going to be out and where they can get it and also uh you have a website right yes melaniesofka.com Perfect. And all the details about the new album will be over there? Yes, yes. All right. Well, fabulous. And the album is called Ever Ever Since You Never Heard of Me. (laughs) Well, we encourage our listeners to check out the new album. Uh, Also, make sure to head over to nycfab50.com so that you can go see Melanie in person next weekend. And, uh, Melanie, I will keep in touch with with your guy, and we would love to have you come back on for a longer interview later. Great, great. Okay, well, and follow me on Twitter and Facebook. It's on the website. You'll see. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right, you have a wonderful night. Thank you. You too. All right, bye. bye.